Thank you so much for coming today. I'm so happy to have you here. My name is Heather Smith and today's webinar is about community arts advocacy and how to raise funds for your project. Before we begin, I'm going to share a, uh, a story about geese. When geese fly, they fly in a V-shaped uh, formation. The reason why they do that is when they are uh, flapping their wings, they are, lift, they are uh, lifting the air and creating an uplift for the birds that are following them. By flying in this type of formation, they're able to travel 71% further than if they were to travel on their own. If any of the geese fall out of formation, the, the geese immediately feel this uh, drag and resistance and will go back up to uh, fly with the flock. So the reason why I'm sharing this today is because I'm going to be relating um, how we as individuals should be more like the geese when we're coming up and doing our projects. Whoops. Okay. In 2013, I had the opportunity to uh, take uh, an institute course with the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. They have a program called the Change Leader Institute where, where individuals throughout the state of Utah can go and learn skills on how to create programs in our communities to support um, our communities with art. And when I was accepted into this program, I found that it was actually at a really inconvenient time. Um, I was in the middle of going to school. I was working on a, a graduate degree at, at the University of Utah and uh, my recital was coming up. My, my final recital to graduate was coming up. But I knew that this was really important to accept this opportunity because uh, doing community service has always been a real uh, important part of my life. And so in October of 2013, I traveled down to uh, this beautiful location in Moab, Utah. It took about four or five hours of driving time with my uh, digital keyboard in tow. So I attended the conference during the day and then all night I was practicing the piano. <laughs> But the things that I learned in this conference will stay with me forever. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about what I learned from this conference. We, they talked about a lot about leadership and what attributes that leaders have. So what kind of qualities do leaders have? And as a group, we were talking about leaders are able to get people to, to action. They're able to lead a group of people and uh, share a vision. And one of the biggest things that a leader had that we, we thought of was power. Leaders have power. Which made sense that um, we, were, we were talking about leaders of different organizations like CEO of large organizations, the deans of music schools, the um, heads of nonprofits. All of these were what we typically thought of as a formal leader, but there was somebody that had even more power than all of them. And that is a baby. <laughs> a little baby has more power. This little baby has more power in her little finger than all of those other uh, executives combined. She is able to get people to do exactly what she wants with no, uh, with no uh, formal authority. She didn't climb the corporate ladder and yet she is able to get people to do what she needed to get done for herself. And I came away from that uh, institute with a whole different mindset. Originally I thought, oh, I can't do anything in my community really because I'm not the leader of anything. But learning that informal leadership is just as important as uh, a formal position changed my way of thinking. 
So part of the conference that we attended was the fact that we needed to come up with some type of a project, some type of a community project that would help our communities. And we had a whole year to do it. And I had a great idea, which I thought was a great idea for my small uh, county in Davis, my small city in Davis County. We needed, <laughs> we needed a concert hall. This is a uh, beautiful concert hall. It's Kerner Hall at the Tur uh, Toronto, Canada, at the Royal Conservatory. And I thought this is exactly what we need. We need a multi-million dollar concert hall to hold concerts in. But part of the Change Leader Institute was we needed to collaborate with others and get their opinion too, because when we uh, decide to make decisions on things that will affect the lives of other individuals, they should have a voice in that decision too. So for the next several months, I spent time talking to uh, choir directors, theater directors, music teachers, the heads of uh, different art organizations, and uh, came up with a different idea. I had the fortunate opportunity to meet Emma Dugall, who was a change leader with the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. And when I was Googling her and finding out about her, I was amazed to see that Bountiful Davis Art Center was moving to a new facility on Main Street in Bountiful. And when I looked at their website, they had a blueprint on what they wanted for this center. In the middle of the main art gallery, there was a stage. Now, when I had been talking to all of these different people, the different, uh, different organizations, the thing that I heard over and over again was, we didn't need a big venue. We needed a small intimate venue so that we could have small ensemble concerts. We could have recitals for the teachers, students. And so I'm going to share a small video that she talked uh, little, briefly talked about this experience. Bountiful Davis Art Center is moving into their new home, which Bountiful City graciously provided. This past year, I had the opportunity to meet with and discuss the musical needs of city leaders, directors of musical organizations, music teachers, and music enthusiasts throughout Davis County. The message I heard over and over again was the overwhelming response that there is a need for a quality venue to hold concerts and recitals. To meet the needs of the community, Emma Dugall, the Executive Director of BDAC, and the Board of Trustees agreed that if Bountiful Davis Art Center can raise the funds, they will build a recital stage in the main art gallery. We really don't have a space now in Bountiful, and so what that's going to provide is an avenue for those who have talents in that area to come down and give recitals throughout the year, and to add the arts carvings and all that, and then add the piano to this thing, I think just adds this vitality that we want to have down on Main Street. The recital stage that I have played at are small, they're kind of, it's dark, and usually the piano is out of tune. I think that playing music in an art gallery would be an interesting experience because you just get to make art along with the art that is there. We're really excited about having the Arts Center now down on Main Street. I think it's an excellent place because anytime you can bring something to Main Street, you know, like your summer fest, car shows, parades, I mean, anything we can have down there just adds to our beautiful Main Street and it's going to bring a new energy that we haven't felt there in a long, long time. $100,000 is needed to furnish the recital stage with a Steinway Grand Piano, lighting, chairs, and audiovisual equipment. As a music teacher and on behalf of BDAC, I'm asking you to help make this dream a reality.
Okay. <laughs> so Emma said, yes, let's do this. Let's collaborate and put together, make our space a venue so that the music community can uh, can have a, a home as well as far as far as having our recitals there too but it needed a lot of money now in that uh, in that little clip that I shared with you I had originally said one hundred thousand dollars and that's what we originally thought that we needed but it actually we ended up raising uh, about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do all sorts of things for that space we uh, there we got two signways um, we expanded the stage area. We got sound barriers on the walls, took out the stairwell in the middle of the gallery, and um, got the chairs. You had audio uh, video equipment, and all of that took a lot of money. So these are some of the projects that we did to raise the funds for the art center. One of the funnest uh, events that we held were the 88 Hours for 88 Keys piano a -thon. This is a uh, cute uh, picture of one of my little boy students. <laughs> so let me explain why he looks the way that he does. Students and uh, professionals performed live and got pledges to perform for 88 straight hours. And they took turns. So um, we did this over Memorial Day weekend and the early morning shifts were not the ones that a lot of people wanted to choose. So I ended up taking a 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. shift for my students to perform in. And I told them that this is going to be a piano pizza party, um, pajama, pajama party where you get to play in the middle of the night. And so this little boy, he was my first student that was playing at 2 a.m. And he's half of asleep. But this is something that he will remember for the rest of his life. That he got to perform in the, an art gallery on this beautiful piano that he was raising funds for. And he can share this with his own kids someday. He can share the story with them on how he helped make this space possible. Some of the other fundraising initiatives included naming the stage. This was a really big one. This brought in the most um, uh, amount of money. We named the stage after this uh, beautiful, you see this beautiful picture right here of my former teacher, Lenora Ford Brown. We named the stage after her and over 100 people donated uh, because they wanted to create a lasting tribute for her. From this initiative, we uh, received so uh, a very hefty foundation from a foundation in South Carolina from a wonderful uh, former student of Lenora's and so we were able to from her generosity we were able to get a lot of the things that you see here on this stage we sold piano keys so um, people would purchase one uh, they would donate a thousand dollars so that they could own a key and they, would, they wrote their name on the back of the key. Um, they, it was put back into the piano. And so now they feel like they have a stakehold in the, our, our center. We received money from private foundations, government support. Um, it was definitely a huge community initiative. And this is what we created, which I think is, is quite lovely. So it was not the big concert hall like Kerner Hall in Toronto, but it was just perfect for us because it was, it was exactly what our community needed. Whoops. Some of the other events that we've held in our area, this was the most recent, was a monster concert at Centerpoint Legacy Theater. This is where we raised funds for a musical theater to purchase four upright, uh, Boston upright, grand, uh, upright pianos. Um, we were able to raise $28,000 from this concert. And the way we did that is we, we sold tickets for $15. We had a participation fee for $15. We had sponsors. We sold advertisements in our concert program. And what this concert basically was is, um, is like a piano symphony. We had 12 pianos on the stage and different groups would come and perform a piece.
we had over 350 students that performed in um, the main sponsors of this event were the Legacy Center Point Theater because they let us use their space at no cost. Dane's Music brought in all of the beautiful pianos so that our students could perform on them. The Utah Music Teachers Association for our national or local chapter. And then the Bill and Connie Timmons Foundation, which was a, a very generous uh, donor for our event. Here are some cute pictures of some of the students that were performing. And the, this is the, the stage. So four of these pianos were left um, at the center after we purchased them for the, the theater. So now this is the fun part. I'm going to share with you four, I'm going to share with you interviews that I did with four teachers in the western part of the, the of uh, North America. Two from Utah, one from Wyoming, one from Calgary, Canada. And they're going to share with you what they did in their areas to uh, raise funds for their projects. So I'm going to start with Barbara, who did, Barbara Gill did the quilts and concerts. And now I'm going to share with you her bio. Whether playing the piano or singing, Barbara Gill enjoys making music. She has a, mas uh, she has a Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance and a Master of Arts in musicology, uh, musicology from the University of Utah. Regularly performing and adjudicating in the community, Barbara is the librarian and administrative assistant for the Utah Chamber Artists. She is excited to sing virtually for this year's 30th anniversary of the choir. An active member of Utah Music Teachers Association, Barbara is the State communica uh, Communications Committee Chair. Barbara added Let's Play Music to her studio in 2019. She and her husband have three boys and a girl named after a concert hall. <laughs> and you will hear about that concert hall during this interview. I'd love to hear more about the Quilts and Concert fundraiser. Can you tell me about it? So it was an all day event in September of 2010 and it involved five recitals during the day with student performers, a silent quilt auction during the day, the whole entire time at the atrium. And then we had a guest performer at night that was the Salt Lake Chamber soloists. So we had the opportunity to perform in Libby Gardner Concert Hall, which is hard to do unless you have a lot of money. <laughs> so was there um, a specific person or a, a group that you were raising this money for? So the Solid Organ Transplant Foundation helps um, transplant recipients and they pay a thousand dollars after insurance for anti-rejection medication. So Barbara, how did you get involved in putting together this, this fundraiser? I was one of the committee members and the head of the committee was Mary Bagley. Mary was part of my Federation chapter and then she joined the Jordan River chapter of UMTA. And with her joining our chapter, she brought this great opportunity. She had a husband who had recently had a heart transplant and Mary's a great pianist. So she uh, got involved at the medical center and just asked some questions. What happens if you can't pay these, the money for this anti rejection medication. What do people do after this heart transplant? Well, she also had this idea and a what if question. What if we could help some way with music? And her idea was, what if we get to perform on Libby Gardner Concert Hall stage and involve our students? So that was one thing that was amazing. And nine of us were asked to help her on the committee. And then there were other aspects that were taken care of by the Solid Organ Transplant Foundation, so. Barbara, was there anything special about this concert that you'd like to share? For me personally to perform and share that stage with my students was amazing, but I also wanted to share that uh, Mary Bagley's husband opened the first recital. He played a Beethoven movement and then Mary closed that first recital playing a Chopin scherzo. And that was just beautiful to see both of them on that stage. Amazing. So were there any challenges that you faced 
when putting together this concert? So the first thing was, will it really happen? Can we get enough people to perform to make this work? And we decided to have five recitals and have each performer sell tickets so that they could generate the money. We asked them to sell $100 in tickets, whether it was a family ticket or single tickets, and have the goal of each recital bring in around $2,000. So, of course, everyone wants to do it in the beginning, and then they, they might think, oh, we're not gonna be around, we'll be out of town. Uh, this is a lot of money to fundraise. Is it really worth it? And for me and one of my friends, we wanted to perform at Libby Gardner Concert Hall. I've sung there, but I had never played on the pianos. And this was an opportunity for me as well as my students. So just getting enough people to want to perform was one of the issues. So if you were raising $2,000, if the goal was to raise $2,000 for each concert, did you meet your fundraising goal? So we raised $11,000 in five titles. We had 101 performers from 21 piano studios and 100% of the proceeds were donated to the University of Utah Transplant Buddy Foundation. Barbara, we should do this again. <laughs> <laughs> we should, I want to do this. This was an amazing, fun opportunity. Fun, fun, fun. Thank you so much, Barbara. Yes, I, I definitely think that we should do that again. Okay, oops, let's go on. <laughs> We're going to go on to Paula Flynn. Paula is the owner and operator of Way Out West Music Academy in Glen Rock, Wyoming, since 1988. She obtained her Master of Music in Piano Performance and Pedagogy from the University of Denver. She offers private piano and voice lessons, as well as group classes. In addition to teaching in the academy, she teaches at Casper College as an adjunct instructor of piano. Paula is a member of the Wyoming Music Teachers Association and serves as president-elect. I'd love to hear more about your Children Helping Children event. What was that all about? We have a former member at the Casper Music Teachers Association, um, named Arlene Osborne. Sadly, she passed three years ago, but um, obviously before she passed, um, I wanna say it's been about a decade. It's closing in on a decade. Uh, she had a student whose sister needed an organ transplant. And um, so she started this fundraising through children's um, playing of a recital um, in the fall. Um, she started this to raise money for that student's sibling. And um, then the students enjoyed it so much and felt like, oh my gosh, I was able to help this other child and they wanted to do it again. Um, I'm not sure that it was the very next year or if it was a couple years later, um, but Arlene's daughter, Jamie Purcell, is the executive director for the Wyoming Food for Thought Project which um, has a backpack program and the backpack program puts food in children's backpacks who, who over the weekend would not have food to eat. It's her daughter that has the Wyoming Food for Thought and that's what our Children Helping Children has been focused on the last several years. So what volunteers uh, come to help with the Children Helping, helping Children? It's generally Casper Music Teachers Association that um, is, is running the fundraiser, but it's open to anyone who wants to participate. Well, that's yeah. great. So as far as the results, how many um, packs, were they packs of food that you created for these children to take home? So this year it was um, boxes of cereal. Um, the cereal donation was not as large as our um, uh, granola bar last year, <laughs> but um, our our finances this year, uh, I think we beat last year's by about three hundred dollars. So Paula, I know that your event was a, a little bit ago. Is it too late if anybody would like to donate still? Um, no, it is not. It's never too late. Um, uh, the Wyoming Food for Thought would take um, cash donations. They will also take um, food donations if you're in the Casper area. Um, they, they are a needy organization that needs as much support and help as they can get. 
you can look them up on Wyoming Food for Thought. Casper, Wyoming, just do a Google search and their website will come up and from there you can follow, um, kind of search around and follow the links to making a donation. And I know that they would greatly appreciate it. Oh, wonderful. I'll put their, I'll put their link in my, in on this recording as well. Excellent. Great. Great. Sounds like such a wonderful event for your community and so, so, um, so needed too. Oh yeah. Um, thank, yeah. Thank you, Paul, for sharing this wonderful information with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Heather. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much, Paula. That was great. I, it was such a pleasure to get to hear the experience. Hear Whoops. I'm going to try that again. <laughs> it's such a great experience to hear. Um, what you are doing in your your community you have such a supportive community our next interview uh, interviewee is Derek Chu Derek is a Canadian pianist and pedagogue who enjoys an active professional career in two, uh, 2016 and 2018 he was named by Steinway and Sons as one of the top teachers in Calgary Alberta he has performed solo and chamber recitals throughout Canada, the United States, and Europe. He has been teaching online since 2015 and provides consultation to teachers who are interested in establishing a virtual teaching presence. In 2003, Derek graduated with a Master of Music degree from the Manhattan School of Music in New York City. And where I know Derek from is through the Royal Conservatory, where he is a clinician, an Alberta representative and a member of the College of Examiners. So we're going to hear about his event, Kids versus Concert, uh, Kids versus Cancer. Can you tell me about some of the outreach benefit concerts you have been involved in? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm here in Calgary, Alberta, and I've been actively involved since university with a group called the Between Friends Club of Calgary. And I worked there for three or four summers and it was a, a camp designed for kids with disabilities. And I have a, a love for these kids. One of my cousins is uh, developmentally delayed. Um, another one of my nieces right now, she's completely blind. So I just have this love for kids, especially those who have disabilities and to me they deserve to have as blessed and fun and amazing childhood as able-bodied kids and so I worked at this camp for several years we'd take them swimming we do overnights in the woods play soccer volleyball lots of great things and when I graduated university and became a professional musician I wanted to do something uh, for these kids and this camp runs completely on donorship it goes through in Alberta here, uh, lotteries and funding and grants. And so I want to do some concerts to raise money for them. And so I did a number of uh, collaborative recitals and solo recitals, invited many of my friends out and put it out there. Um, this is well before social media. So it's the old fashioned way and calling people uh, to come out and support this wonderful organization. Can you tell me what was successful? What have you found has been successful in these concerts? What I have always enjoyed is just seeing the smiles of kids. That, that to me is success, right? I mean, of course, we're, we're raising money. We're trying to help these organizations get money. But the most important thing is why, right? And when you see the kids smile, that's the most exciting thing, right? Whether they're at your concert because they want to come hear you play, or um, when they get a new basketball net or they get new equipment for the camp. That's what's really exciting for them because that's what allows them to enjoy their summers. Derek, I know that you've been involved with Kids Versus Cancer for quite some time. Can you tell us a little bit about that organization? Yeah, back in uh, 2004, uh, I was asked on behalf of um, some philanthropists here in Calgary if I wanted to play a concert for the New Children's Hospital. They were doing some projects um, for the cancer wing, and I said, I would, I'd love to do that. And so it was great. We, we had an art auction, and between the art auction, I would play uh, performances of a number of different pieces. It was a real fun evening, cocktails, 
uh, meeting people from the hospital, seeing some of these kids who had been affected by cancer, and just hearing from them and how much it meant for them to be in an event that was in benefit for them. So Derek, are there any other things that you do at the hospital? Yeah, every year uh, I bring students who are gold medalists from the Royal Conservatory of Music. So they achieve the highest mark in our certificate program exams. And we go there on a Saturday uh, morning for a few hours and these gold medalists perform for the sick kids, their families, and the medical staff there. Um, it breaks my heart that a lot of these kids have to spend their holidays in the hospital. I mean, I spent some time in this hospital too, uh, which is why I have a relationship with them. And I've sent my kids to the hospital. I haven't sent them, but I take my kids to the hospital um, when they were young, because as a new father, I had no idea what was going on. And so I, I have a lot of a respect for that hospital and the medical team there. So it's, it's a way to say thank you. It's a way to just, again, be in touch with these kids. I bring the Royal Conservatory students over. They play for a couple hours. Um, we have a girl who's dressed up as a, like a candy gram and she gives out um, candy canes to all the kids. Uh, the arts administrator there sets up uh, coloring stations. So we make it a really fun morning for all of these sick kids so they can enjoy the festivities as well, so they can enjoy the season. And um, we brought Santa Claus, we brought elves, we do a lot of little fun things like this so that um, they can enjoy that Christmas spirit, which I think is really important for all kids to experience. Thank you so much, Derek. I appreciate your time. Yes, that was that was wonderful. Thank you, Derek. It was it's so um, inspiring to see that there's such a need in in um, everywhere, especially for children. So we're going to move on to our last is uh, Dr. Ruby Chow with Giving Tuesday Mundi Project. So I'm going to give you uh, share with you her bio. Dr. Ruby Chow is a classical pianist, educator, and arts executive. As the executive director of Mundi Project, a nonprofit community music organization based in Salt Lake City, Utah, Dr. Chow and her team focuses on actively breaking down socioeconomic and generational barriers by providing quality music experiences for all. Ruby earned a doctoral degree in human and uh, in music and human learning from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree in piano performance from, Man uh, from Manhattan School of Music in New York City. Ruby immigrated to Salt Lake City from Taiwan at age six and speaks Mandarin Chinese. And I just have to say that Ruby and I went to school together and she is one of my favorite people. Here is her interview. Yeah, so Giving Tuesday, if you haven't heard about it before, it was actually launched in 2012 as a international campaign. And um, it makes it so that people in the community can give at least once a year through Giving Tuesday, and it's always the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. So back in May, Giving Tuesday launched a, um, just a, just real, kind of off the cuff, that um, you know, they saw that nonprofits were in a position where they, were, they weren't sure what was happening because of COVID, and so they said, we have this platform, let's go ahead and offer up to nonprofits that wanted to um, encourage community to chip in so that nonprofits could continue doing what they were doing. And so we decided, yes, let's do this because you know we, we weren't sure what, what was going on either. And it was just a great time to be able to bring the community together to share what it is that we were still trying to do and were able to do. Wonderful, and, and I, from what I understand, you also were performing, and people were giving in suggestions on what they wanted you to play. It was really fun, and so to kind of help prepare a little bit, you know, and to get people to interact with me on Facebook, I said, hey, you know, like, give me your recommendations now so I can, so I can pull some things together. So I did have a playlist, essentially, and then I also had, um, I had my computer, I had my iPad, I had a bunch of my popular sheet music, 
so that I took, I so that I could take a couple requests, live requests, and I'd be like, hey, one second, let me just pull up the sheet music, and I would play a snippet from it. So it was a lot of fun of that way to get people, you know, live, and they were hearing music that we were doing, and then I would send them to our donation link on Facebook. Oh, that's so fabulous. What a funny, I remember that event. So, so fun. <laughs> so, Ruby, tell me what was successful about the event. So that was a uh, that was actually probably our most successful giving Tuesday campaign that we've ever done. Uh, we pulled in almost two thousand dollars just from online donations, and it was just really cool to be able to feature people that had interacted with us and that they could speak about why music made a difference to them and what you know what they've gained from the Do Project. So I think it was really valuable to get the community to have a role in supporting us and to say, hey, you know, this is why we need Nindu Project. So please, if you can, you know, do what you can. Wonderful. Thank you. So Giving Tuesday is coming up again on December 1st. It if is. Somebody, if somebody wants to donate to Moon Day Project, how can they do that? So if you are doing this Giving Tuesday on Facebook, you can go ahead and create a post either within your studio group or on your own page if your students follow you. So go ahead and create a post, and over on the bottom right, and add to your post, click on the three dots for more. And it'll take you to the option of raise money. So if you click on that, you can click, you can search for the nonprofits you want to support. So I'm gonna go ahead and click Mindy Project. And then you can go ahead and write about why it is that you wanna support Mindy Project, what is it that they do, and then you can select post. And if you're an Instagram studio and your families are much more familiar with it, you can do Instagram live videos. When you click to add to your story to go, you can select to go live. And then on the left, if you click on the heart, it will allow you to select a nonprofit. Thank you so much, Ruby, for taking the time to speak with us today and sharing how music studios and teachers can help support nonprofits. Absolutely. This is a great chance for everyone to do it from the safety of their homes and to be able to share their music and share it with their family, share it with their friends, and to be able to do some good in, during this time of, of need for a lot of organizations out there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, Ruby. I love the Mundi Project. The Whoops. Director. There we go. <laughs> I keep doing that. So... At this point, we're almost done with our webinar and you might be thinking, where do I go from here? Or you might be feeling quite overwhelmed. You might be thinking, oh, this is, that's a lot of work. All of these projects take, a, take a, a big time commitment. And yes, they do. They do take time. But if you choose to do something with a community, with others that are just as passionate as you about a, a cause or an event, like the geese, you're going to be able to travel a lot far, farther, do a lot more good as a group. So I'm going to give you a challenge. My challenge for you is for the next couple of weeks, think about what does your community need? Write, that, write down some ideas. And then the, the second step is to make a list of those in your community that you think that would be good supporters that might like to participate in, in doing something. Um, talk to individuals, talk to organizations, and listen to what they have to say too because you might uh, be pleasantly surprised to find that your idea sort of molds into something even greater. So I'm going to leave with you one quote by Walt Disney. He said, you don't build it for yourself. You know what people want and you build it for them. And I think that's such an important concept to remember for when you're doing community arts advocacy that it's not for you. It's not to build your own um, resume. It's to support those in need, to give back to your community, and especially if it's children, because what a greater impact can one make than to do something for a child? That's um, something that I think that we could all aspire to. So thank you so much for coming. Next month's webinar will be on how to raise additional funds by holding um, group classes. And I hope that you have a wonderful, safe Thanksgiving. Stay healthy, stay safe, 
and I will see you next month. Thank you.